uh, Chair of Math and Sciences at Elmira College and Associate Professor of Biology. I'm really excited to introduce you tonight to Meg, Dr. Meg Lohman, um, Canopy Meg. She is a really awesome speaker um, with excellent experience in, in biology and environmentalism and um, trees. Um, and so I'm not going to delay because we're a little bit late starting as it is. I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Meg Lohman. Oh, also, if you have questions, please feel free to write them in the chat. And then at the end of the presentation, um, we, will, we will address the, um, take some time for questions. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Dan. And I'm going to share my screen here. Um, so hopefully that will not have any technical glitches. It's wonderful to be here. Kind of in Elmira, New York. I'm actually down in Florida where it's sunny but chilly and I think a lot of you are in the snow or who knows where you are. But welcome. Tonight we will visit some warm tropical forests. We will kind of think hard about ways that we can all get engaged in saving some of these wonderful natural resources and end up talking about a brand new program that Elmira College is about to launch. Uh, so with greatest joy, I get to take you to the rainforest tonight and you are my guests as we travel from tree to tree. So I will say that uh, some of you might already know I grew up in Elmira, New York. Here are some of my girls at the Meg Lauman Treetops Camp out in Tanglewood Reserve, which is just outside of Elmira, New York. We have an amazing cadre of young women who are learning to climb trees. In fact, I should probably ask the audience, have you ever climbed a tree? And hopefully a lot of you are raising your hands. Uh, it is a great way to connect to nature. And it's been a point of pride um, that we have this program in Elmira, New York, and hopefully other places around the world are catching on. I've been chatting with Google, who wants to start a new program with girls in India and girls in Asia. So stay tuned for all of that. And I'm seeing some names come up of people that have raised your hands. So that's pretty wonderful. Um, so these are the trees of Elmira, New York. In fact, these are the trees in my neighborhood where I grew up. And I only point that out because I guess looking at nature in upstate New York got me pretty excited about becoming a scientist. And I will also confess that mostly girls did not study science in my day. Um, so I'm happy uh, to mentor and encourage and try to inspire as many girls in science. But also as a mom of two boys, I'm delighted when male uh, gender uh, folks enter into the world of science too. So we need everybody these days to give their creative and innovative thoughts to the world of conservation and the world of biodiversity that I'm about to talk about. Um, here I am in fifth grade in Elmira, New York, taking my little wildflower collection to Cortland, where the New York State Science Fair was being held. And lo and behold, there were mostly boys in that gymnasium, as you can probably appreciate, in the 1960s. Uh, I did get a second prize, a little plastic trophy that made me feel like I was probably the most important scientist that I ever dreamed of knowing, but I didn't even know any scientists, true confession. So that was a great experience. And uh, ever since that little wildflower collection that uh, came from all the roadsides around Elmira, New York, I studied botany and became pretty passionate about plants. Um, my neighbor in Elmira was a crazy guy on the left named Tommy Hilfiger and his sister Betsy in the middle was one of my best friends. So lo and behold, we all marvel at what was going on in Elmira, New York, that some of us lashed out and did all these wild and crazy things. So it's been a fun journey to track what happens when you grow up in a small town. And I still think Elmira is a great place to study the environment because obviously it was really special for me. So with that, um, I will also say that my hometown, my family roots are about 10 miles outside of Elmira, where Lauman, New York is a farm town and always was, it still is. I looked at my family lineage and couldn't find any scientists, but I can only say that my great, great grandparents made a pretty good use out of plants during the prohibition, I've been told, because they produced some whiskey out of some of the botanicals that they grew on the farm. So that's about as close as it came in the Lauman family to creating any botanists, I guess, until I came along. 
So lo and behold, I left Elmira, did a biology degree in college, and went on to get a scholarship to study it in Australia, which was pretty crazy for a girl from Elmira. And the funny thing about that is that the trees in other parts of the world are a lot bigger and taller than they were in Elmira, New York. So suddenly I was in tropical rainforests in Australia and eventually in Asia and South America. And these trees are several hundred feet tall. So I had to figure out a way to study all those leaves at the top of the tree. And that led me to developing some crazy methods like sewing a harness out of seatbelt webbing that you can see there and making my first slingshot out of a piece of metal and figuring out ways to get a rope up into a tree so that we could climb up there and study what lives there. Here's one of my students, only last year, she goes where nobody dares to go, but this is the top of a 300 foot redwood tree and that's Wendy Baxter out in California. So these simple methods of ropes and harnesses have really catapulted, no pun intended, the world's knowledge of the treetops, which has been fabulous. Here's another uh, set of my colleagues in Taiwan where we were studying, again, some of the taller trees in the world. I had to put arrows to point to the people because we're so tiny in this picture. Um, so with these very simple techniques, we have discovered now that about half of the world's species live in the tops of trees, which is pretty amazing considering we only started studying the treetops about 30 years ago. And whereas an astronaut is someone who studies outer space, and that actually started in the 1960s when we went to the moon, an arbornaut is the technical term for what I do, someone who studies the tops of trees, and that actually started in the 1980s. So it's actually younger than space exploration and all the more reason that we need students and volunteers and participants to become experts in the treetops because there's so much up there to discover. In fact, we probably know less than 10% of what's up there. So this led me to do a few other things. When you have a rope up a tree, you can only put one person up there at a time or it becomes pretty dangerous and the rope might break. So we developed these very cool canopy walkways or treetop skywalks in Australia in 1985. We're hoping one will come to Elmira in the next few years. There's been some talk and hopeful funding and planning, but right now about 70 of these walkways exist around the world. One is in Vermont, uh, one is down in Millbrook, New York. Uh, there's one at my alma mater, Williams College. There's one down here in Florida, which is fabulous in a state park and some pretty amazing ones in the Amazon and around the world. So it's a great way to get into the treetops just by walking and you can go there without any kind of feeling of danger as you might do if you're in a rope swinging around in the treetops. We now have, as I mentioned, some different walkways around the world. This is the walkway at Williams College, which was the first walkway in North America. And this is my walkway down here in Florida, about 10 minutes from my house that's in a state park where half a million people can visit it every year for free, which is fabulous and gives a lot of students and young people a real sense of how it is to become an arbornaut. Um, other methods that we now use to study the treetops because there's a great urgent need to make these discoveries before the forests are cleared. Um, this is a construction crane put up by the Smithsonian down in Panama. Here's a hot air balloon developed by the French teams of botanists which floats over the treetops with that very cool raft that you can alight on the treetops like a almost like a space station or maybe a little bit of a inflatable raft that we can all live and work in the treetops. And here's a little tiny portable sled, as we call it, that moves from tree to tree so that we can collect and sample. You'll see at the top of this picture, however, the ratios for my work as a field biologist are still pretty miserable. So I'm recruiting girls. Uh, in this trip to uh, Cameroon, Africa, a couple of years back, we had 49 men and only one female. So I'm still anxious to turn that ratio around in the next decade or so. And here you can see me just barely at about one o'clock toward the center coming through a little porthole in this canopy raft to do some research at night when a lot of the insects are out feeding, which sometimes becomes a very important time for research to occur. 
So forest canopies, because of our knowledge of the treetops, now is a place that really does keep humans alive without those biodiverse organisms living in the treetops, without incredible billions of leaves that produce energy, without the carbon storage of trees and the amazing medicines and building materials and fruits and foods that we get from the canopies of many trees, um, we could not stay alive. So this knowledge has really been gained in the last couple decades and means that it becomes even more critical for us to try our best to save forests. And it's a pretty desperate and urgent cause because in my lifetime alone, half of the world's forests have disappeared. So depending on how old you are, um, if you're older than I am, that means even more than half. And if you're younger, a little bit less. But this is a pretty critical time for us to turn around some of our policies and develop sustainable ways to conserve forests. Um, this is what's happening in a nutshell. I think all of you are aware of this past year, watching the news, seeing forests burn in Australia, in Siberia, in California, in the Amazon. And of course, meanwhile, in the background, all sorts of forests are being cleared for different agricultural and urban developments. So we have a real significant problem with forest disappearance. And it's pretty obvious that those forests can't come back in without hundreds of years of restoration. <clears throat> Those poor old koalas in uh, Australia need probably three or 400 years before some of those forests are mature enough for them to go back and live in the tops of the gum trees. So what are we gonna do about that? We can panic, and we can run away, we can do nothing, or we can be good citizens and fabulous students at Elmira College and think about ways that we can save these forests. I wanted to share with you four ways that I have been saving forests in hopes that maybe some of these ideas could trickle down to projects of your own back home, wherever you might live. Um, one thing I've been trying to do desperately with all of my research as a professor and a scientist is include students at every turn. And I've been pretty lucky to have some different programs with students. Believe it or not, several decades ago, I did participate in one of the first distance learning programs for middle school students to come to the canopy with me and go undersea with Bob Ballard to discover marine life. And together, the two of us pioneered a program called the Jason Project, where we took technology and used it to bring major field trips into the classroom. Because I can't take a million kids into the treetops, but I can bring the treetops to a million kids through this satellite technology that we used in the 90s. Um, we also brought students with us to serve as the actors and the movie stars for our shows. And um, even in certain cases, I brought my own two boys because tree climbing is pretty much fun for everybody. And it made for a very um, great opportunity for me as a mom, as well as for my kids. So we can engage students at every turn and um, hopefully they will become the amazing scientists of the future. Here's uh, another one of my students named Anthony, who's discovered that the tops of these redwood trees in California actually suck in fog directly from the leaves. They don't need the root systems for all their water. So that's been a fabulous discovery. And Anthony is a hugely successful tree climber, as you can tell from this picture. Um, here are some of my star third grade students. Uh, they have been out to this canopy in Florida that I built in the state park and lo and behold, used their eyes and ears and saw a new species of weevil that they alone discovered and got to help publish it. So they are now published scientists. The moral of that story is you probably don't need a PhD. You just need to be a great field biologist and make sure you look and make observations when you go to the forest. Um, here's another one of my students, Bryson, who went to New College in Florida with me, and um, he's showing some Amazon kids how to use a drone because we now have these other technologies that we can use to map trees, which is really great fun. 
here's a few of my students in wheelchairs. You say, wow, how can they be canopy scientists? But the technology today is such that we can take kids with mobility limitations and they too can discover new things in the canopy. This girl on the left named Rebecca helped discover eight new species in the treetops of oak trees. So there's plenty there for everybody to discover. And it's really great, I think, to involve students because they are the future group of scientists. Here's one of Rebecca's little water bears. They're awful cute, aren't they? Um, I guess only a mother could love it. But anyway, they're microscopic, they're extremophile, and probably the most common organism in the trees of Elmira, New York. So everybody needs to know that if you're listening to this webinar tonight from upstate New York. Um, a second thing that I've learned over time is trying to engage more women in my science because women are really the environmental stewards in so many countries and especially developing countries where oftentimes women have to garden, they have to collect the food, they have to collect the water and all of these resources are pretty tough to come by in certain places. These women here in Assam in northern India are looking for fish to put on the table for dinner and you can imagine it's a pretty daunting task. But by engaging this amazing intelligence and um, knowledge of women who are great environmental stewards, we can really advance the world of conservation in a bigger and better way. Um, so whenever I try to travel into countries where perhaps girls don't have as much opportunity, I've been able to lead classes for women cl schools. I've been able to take girls up into the treetops and teach them to climb and do my best to try to think of units of activity that girls can participate in that might inspire them to become stewards of the forest. And who knows, maybe someday one of them will become the head of the forestry department in India or somewhere else. Um, this is Ethiopia, where I actually mentored all of the women faculty at um, Jima University, the largest university in Ethiopia. And guess what? That's the extent of the women faculty of the largest university in that whole country. So you can certainly uh, understand that they need a lot of assistance and role models and resources. And the more that we can do to help women in some of these countries, I think the better off science will be. Um, back at home, as you all know, we have our girls camp in Elmira, New York. We have a lot of programs now for women and girls in STEM, which I think is a really fabulous thing. Um, here are some of my girls in North Carolina, where I used to work, uh, all climbing together, having a good old time in the canopy. Um, so in a sense, getting women involved in treetop research or getting women involved in environmental work and sustainability is really just another facet of social justice. And global environmental justice right now is pretty skewed um, for people in many countries. And by engaging women, hopefully we can increase the chances of the next generation getting access to good resources like fresh water and pollinators of their crops. And at the same time, we can cultivate those sustainable scientists of the future. So we have involving students in research, we have engaging women in all sorts of projects that we lead in other countries. And thirdly, I wanna talk a little bit about engaging diverse stakeholders. And one of the most amazing projects I've been working on in the last decade or so has been saving the forests of Ethiopia because 95% of those forests are gone. And the success here has been by partnering with the church. Church and science, people say, oh my gosh, those are strange bedfellows, but believe it or not, the church leadership are the best mentors and inspiration for saving the forests, which you'll see in a minute. Um, here's an aerial view of Ethiopia. You can only just barely see those little tiny green dots, which are the remaining forest in this world of subsistence agriculture. Uh, throughout the rest of the landscape. And up close, those little green dots are the churchyards of those round Coptic or Ethiopian Orthodox churches in the center. And the neat thing about that religion is that they do believe that they are the stewards of all of God's creatures. So a successful church has a forest around it. But unfortunately, as you can also see, the church 
um, is losing those forests. Cattle come in and eat the seedlings and the saplings. The boundaries are shrinking by farmers doggedly clearing a little bit more to get a better harvest. And a lot of the wildlife is being lost to hunting and also to the shrinkage of the environment itself. So there's a desperate need in Ethiopia to save this last 5% of forests. It's the only genetic library for the whole country. It's where all the native species live. And obviously it's the source of medicines and foods and the last bastion for a lot of important genetic diversity in the country of Ethiopia. So the success here has been to first of all, partner with the priests by leading workshops. Here I am giving a workshop about the importance of trees and the priests are so on board. They love their forests, they love their biodiversity and together we're working out ways that they can be better stewards of their forest. And as I mentioned before, they know that these forests provide all these important services, pollinators, honey, shade, medicines, oxygen, freshwater, timber, a spiritual heritage, um, storage of carbon, conservation of soil, and of course a home to so much biodiversity. So to save those forests, um, the priests of their own volition figured out that they could take the stones out of the nearby fields, which the farmer appreciates, and they can build these beautiful walls that keep the cattle and sheep out, that make a perimeter for the forest and allow them to keep those native trees in the center. So these conservation walls are proving incredibly successful and all of the people really appreciate them. So this has allowed us to come over and do some research on the biodiversity. Here's a group of a team from National Geographic that I brought over about five years ago to survey the insects. And so with the strength of our partnership between religion and science, we're satisfying everybody's needs, saving the trees and also researching the biodiversity. And today, if you go to Ethiopia, you can pass by some of these church forests and you'll see these beautiful stone walls. You'll see that stark subsistence agriculture and dry soil on the outside, but that magnificent lush forest on the inside. And this is a great success. And the priests are thrilled because they are achieving their own job description, which is to be the stewards of all of God's creatures. And I, as a biologist, am achieving my goal of conserving biodiversity. The kids are an amazing resource for the future, but they don't have a lot of textbooks in their school. So the challenge next for me is figuring out how we can give the kids enough resources to do um, future research, to do observations, to collect data, to become those stewards of the future. And so one of the things I did was make t-shirts for the kids with the local pollinators and try to engage them with their own field guide on their backs. Because if you don't have a library or a bookshelf at home, and if the schools don't have libraries, which they don't, um, you need to figure out how to give kids some kind of checklist for insects that won't end up getting wet or destroyed or something else. So a piece of paper isn't good enough, but a t-shirt is a really prestigious thing and the kids love wearing these bug t-shirts. Um, the other thing that we've started doing is distributing books to the students because most kids in rural Ethiopia have never owned a book, not even one. And by bringing a book in their own language that talks about the importance of their trees, it gives them a real step forward in understanding the importance of conservation. But we still need more ideas. These kids need um, great resources for the future. And I'm always asking my audiences when I speak, please help me think of ways that we can get these kids the right kinds of tools. They can't use computer programs if they don't have computers and they can't use iPhones to take pictures of biodiversity if they don't have an iPhone. So we need to think about what is the toolkit to educate kids in some of these more um, areas that are rural and farther away from technology. Um, so number four is another uh, tool in my toolkit that is now proving successful in saving forests. Believe it or not, these 
canopy walkways that I mentioned before have become a really important source of income for local people and indigenous people in some of these tropical forests such as the Amazon or uh, places like Mozambique are able to get full-time sustainable employment by becoming guides or cooks or operating ecotourist lodges and these walkways are of course a draw card for American and European tourism so we're really hopeful that saving for forests by creating a sustainable income for local people through canopy tours could become something very, very important and permanent in the future of many forests. This is the longest canopy walkway in the world, which is down in the Amazon. There have been participants on my citizen science trips from Elmira, New York, and hopefully I'll be able to bring some Elmira college students there someday. Uh, this is a fabulous walkway that now employs about 100 and 17 families and has caused the local reserve of forests to grow from about a thousand acres to over a million acres because the local people see the success of having this long-term sustainable income instead of just making a short-term income from logging trees. Here's the region of that walkway. It's a fabulous pristine part of the Amazon and really really important to all of our futures. Um, another walkway example is here in uh, Western Samoa. We went across a team of us and built a canopy walkway that allowed an entire island to keep from logging its forests because they had to build a school which cost $50,000 and by building this ecotourism business they paid the debt off in two years whereas if they'd logged the trees they probably would no longer even be able to live on their island. Um, here's one of the newest walkways over in Malaysia, and this walkway now attracts 2 million visitors a year. And this walkway is right through a pristine Asian rainforest that we have recently proposed as a UNESCO World Heritage Area based on the amazing discoveries that we were able to make in the canopies while creating this walkway. So again, the layers of success for these canopy projects are expanding and illustrating to us that we can use canopy tools as a mechanism for conservation. So with the strength of that idea of building these walkways, giving people employment and making bigger and better discoveries in the canopy, I just started my own new project, which I call Mission Green. There's a really cool lady named Sylvia Earle who has a program called Mission Blue, where she saves hope spots in the ocean. She highlights really important high biodiversity coral reefs and places. And Sylvia is a really wonderful explorer of undersea. And she and I have partnered for me to launch Mission Green, which will create um, and identify hotspots in rainforests where we need to build canopy walkways to save the highest biodiversity. So we're pretty excited about that. You can see that the yellow dots represent walkways that we're fundraising to build. Um, the red dots represent walkways we already have. And all of those red dots are walkways where local people have gainful employment and the ability to make discoveries by students is extraordinary because they have this fabulous skywalk to work from. My uh, sort of inspiration for this project is a really famous biodiversity scientist named E.O. Wilson. Some of you might know who he is. He wrote a cool book called Half Earth that proposes we should save half the earth for 99% of species and maybe keep the other half for that one species species we call homo sapiens. Um, and I said to Ed, I said, well, how about if we pick those 10 areas of highest biodiversity, even without saving half the earth, we might save half the biodiversity. So he's helping me identify these hot spots where we're planning to build these canopy walkways in the next 10 years. Stay tuned because maybe some of you can join up in the construction or the research or the planning um, or even the training of local people in some of these projects.
And last but not least, I want to segue from that sustainability program called Mission Green to just give a little bit of a, a shout out for Elmira College. Uh, they're about to launch a new minor in sustainability, which is very exciting and really important because in this case, having a minor will allow students of economics or language or mathematics or science or even something as different as uh, students that might study English literature um, to become more engaged in thinking of ways to apply their knowledge to sustainability. So. I think the future will be bright with more students starting to understand how does it use water and soil and air to make cotton? How is it that we can harvest trees sustainably without harming the forests? And how can we ensure that the honeybees of the world aren't going to become extinct through different kinds of infections? There are so many ways that we can approach this thing called sustainability and um, hopefully make the world a better place for our children. But it does all start with students learning about it. And I think Elmira College is positioned now to really lead the charge on that. So I look forward to seeing how that unfolds. Uh, I look forward to continuing to be a small part of that program. And with that, um, I just had a couple little notes about that. Um, we're hoping with this minor that it will interface with different majors, um, which is great. Uh, we're also thinking about local internships to give students lots of experience in applying their knowledge. Uh, we're hoping to have case studies in things as wild and wonderful as fashion or maybe water quality um, and maybe even an international travel component, which would give students some hands-on experience. So the bottom line is, if we don't conserve this planet, uh, both locally and globally, there's not much hope for any other kinds of professions or pathways in life. And it certainly jeopardizes all of the students' future if we can't figure out ways to conserve the planet. <coughs> and there's a few of my partners in crime. Hopefully Tommy Hilfiger and Betsy will get involved with me. And the moral of the story is, um, I hope that all of you will use sustainability principles at home. Um, you're welcome to check out my websites for any of these projects. And I think now it's probably a good chance to ask some questions and hear what it is you want to know more about. So thanks a lot. Thanks, Meg. Um, I just want to remind everybody, um, if you want to submit a question, um, if you go to the bottom of your screen and click on chat, you can type in anything there. Um, okay, so the first question, will this presentation be available to replay? I'm a fifth grade teacher. Um, I think this would probably actually go to Jen, who's recording it. It is being recorded. Um, Jen, could you unmute yourself really quick and say if, if we can uh, yes, the presentation is being recorded and um, we will share that link with those who registered and we'll also share that out on the college's social media as well. Great. So yes, they're, they're doing a, a project for their fifth graders in Sydney, New York, New York and currently reading the book, The Most Beautiful Roof in the World. The students are writing an essay right now about research methods and biodiversity. They would be so excited to see this presentation. So sounds like they're going to be able to. Fantastic, that's great. Um, just a lot of comments about thank you, flabbergasted <laughs> by the, all that you've done. Um, yeah, hey, I, well, I guess there's good fresh water in Elmira, New York. It wasn't a bad place to grow up. <laughs> uh, Meg, the the tree thing, I believe. <laughs> looking at green spaces in urban environments. Do you want to say anything about that? Sure. Um, so, you know, I talked mostly about trying to save big trees in pristine forests because those are sort of the machinery of the planet. They're like the air conditioning and the heaters and the producers. But in every city, of course, we have urban trees that are equally important for people who live in cities. Sometimes they're your first um, experience to see a leaf up close or maybe watch a butterfly or see a bird nest. So they're truly important. And urban canopy cover is becoming increasingly important to provide ecosystem services. I think in Elmira, New York, uh, one of my colleagues named Alan Winston is part of a program where the environmental 
team and the government is going to get together and really start serving your trees and your canopies. My biggest concern about urban trees is they're oftentimes small. And we have, in America, I think an average age of an urban tree is something like nine years old because every time a road gets widened, people cut the tree down. Or every time somebody develops a new strip mall or a new roadside something, they tend to cut the trees down and not value them. So I think one of the really important things to be thinking about is how can we increase the voice of a big tree and make sure that it's a really important resource that lasts, that is part of the landscape and is part of the future. Because a big tree, as you can tell, stores a hundred times more carbon than a small tree and produces a thousand times more oxygen than a small tree. So we really need to prioritize those big trees. And the best and biggest trees are still in the Amazon and Southeast Asia and places like that, but we need to do our roles back at home and preserve trees and teach kids about trees. And I hope that Elmira and other cities can maybe become exemplary in terms of their green conservation. It's really, really important. Okay, I have an, another question. Actually, I have quite a few coming in, so I'll try to get to all of them. Uh, where did you get your funding for your work in Ethiopia? Oh, well, first of all, as a field biologist, it's tough to get funding. I, you know, if I could have the budget of one space mission, I could probably save the forests of half the countries in the world. It's so ridiculous and crazy that it's very tough to get big funding for uh, natural history and for natural resources in many cases. Um, in the case of Ethiopia, I have had some funding by National Geographic, but very small grants. The biggest success if you can believe it, is fifth graders and elementary school kids where they go on my website and they see programs like this and they hear me talk about it and they give up their lunch money for a week or they do a penny drive and they send me a check for $50. And we have raised over $250,000 from kids like that. And we're now halfway towards a goal of a half a million, which is all it's going to cost to save the 40 highest biodiversity forests in Ethiopia. Now, granted, things are very inexpensive over there. They have a very low cost of living, um, which is tragic in so many ways, but also in this case, it means that we can make a big difference for smaller amounts of money. It costs billions of dollars to save trees in the Amazon, but it's costing a lot less in Ethiopia. But truly, it's the children of the world who care about trees in other countries and care about kids in other countries, because I think their teachers are giving them a global background. So. I really take my hat off to all you teachers listening because you're obviously doing great things to give those kids so much stewardship. Okay, uh, next question. Do you have any suggestions for ways to engage kids with trees in situations where they can't climb or access them? Sure, well, obviously they can go on and do the screen thing, which I regret to say, but a lot of things have to happen by Zoom or screens now. I have tons of YouTube videos. They're fabulous movies and videos and programs about trees. But if you even have one tree in your backyard or kids can walk to a park or they can walk down the street and see a tree anywhere in their town, there's so much to look at. They can look at when the leaves come out. They can look at how many holes exist in the leaves and try to figure out what's eating them. They can look at all sorts of interesting critters in the bark, like the ants and the little caterpillars that are crawling up the tree. There's so much there in terms of detail. If they can just get a little bit of access to trees. But in the meantime, when people are housebound, uh, maybe you wanna plant some seeds in your windowsill and maybe you could do some experiments. Do trees grow with Coca-Cola or water or detergent or what is it that causes trees to grow fastest? I, I think there's a lot of creative things we can do for kids to think about trees. And I hope that all of you can do that for your students or children. <laughs> Okay, next question is, what effect has COVID had to slow the cutting of trees and saving the green space? You know, it has had a good effect. In many areas, some programs have slowed down. Some of the developments have slowed down. Building of hotels and building of malls, as you know, has probably come to a standstill. So in a sense, it's given trees a lovely chance to breathe and 
get back to their lives before humans in some ways. Um, in other ways, there's a little bit of frustration uh, for those of us who do work on conservation in places like Ethiopia in the Amazon. We can't go there. We can't help the cause. And we have to just hope and pray that some of those chainsaws are resting because I think sometimes it's important to have international presence to give importance value to local programs. And I'm really sad I can't get to Ethiopia and work with my priests there that count on my coming every year and bringing them some small amounts of funding to pay for the gates that go in the forest walls and to make a donation to the church to remind everyone about the importance of their church forest trees. So in some places it's probably slowing things down and other places it's probably leading to a little bit of irresponsibility, but um, it's, it's pretty incredible that it has created so much change and so much pause. Um, next question. Are you aware of the recent studies on fungal communication among trees? Absolutely. And they actually started in New Hampshire, pretty close to Elmira. This guy named Jack Schultz from Penn State first discovered that leaves actually communicate. They release volatile oils. And he did that work in the 1980s. And I know Susan, the lady that did that project from University of British Columbia. I actually worked on similar things in Australia where we discovered that mycorrhizae were giving a distinct advantage to certain rainforest trees to grow bigger and faster than rainforest trees that weren't connected by the mycorrhizae. So in the tropics, it's a lot more competitive than it is in North America where she's finding every tree is connected, but we found that only some trees were connected. So it's kind of cool, but you know, trees do it all. They release communication from their canopies, from their underground parts, and um, they're all, it turns out, I guess, helping each other become successful canopies. Okay. Um the walkways appear to be consistently built. Do you provide the work crews for the walkways? Um, I have done. I've had a team over the years that have done that. There are one or two other teams. There are some styles that include more metal. Some include aluminum, which is very lightweight and can be shipped um, around the world more easily than timber. Uh, so yes, in certain cases, there's a certain style that my teams have adopted, which is timber and using local resources as much as possible. But we do find in certain cases that we need to um, use other builders and we always try try to do local uh, construction when we can. Uh, next one I might actually be even to help, able to help you with. When will EC students be able to take classes and work with you? Um, well, you must answer that. You have to. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think as soon as next year, we are going to try to get, to get um, you a part of the curriculum um, when we start our sustainability minor. So I, I think the answer to that is stay tuned, but um, sooner than later. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Um, another one is just that I totally agree about space funding. Let's focus on saving our planet. Um, last Sunday, New York Times article on communication between trees. Uh -huh. All right. Have you ever worked with the Girl Scouts? There are so many badges and programs related to sustainability that your expertise and enthusiasm can inspire hundreds or thousands of girls to be more involved. You know, such a great idea. And I actually co-wrote the Boy Scout Exploration Badge. And that was pretty cool. That came out a couple of years ago. And for reasons I don't understand, I never quite worked with the Girl Scouts. And I should. And I don't know who heads up the Girl Scouts or where their headquarters is. I know they exist locally. Um, but if anybody has that connectivity up the food chain, it would be great to think harder about that. And I must confess that I'd love to know more about that. Because I know at one point we had Scouts and then we had Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts, and I'm not sure if we have integrated Scouts or whatever, but it would be. I see a note here, headquarters in New York City, and someone works at a council, so maybe you can email me and tell me more about it. Thank you. Um, what do you think about the efforts to incentivize forest protection and good management practices through carbon credit sales? Is it really a sustainable climate solution? Um, I think it's fantastic if we could implement it. Obviously, carbon is a really important storage 
uh, and trees are one a great mechanism for storing carbon. The problem has been implementing it. It, it just has not caught on in the way that we wished it would. Um, paying for carbon credits has become a little bit gray. People sign up, well, is your airline really planting trees? Is your airline saving big trees, which is what it should be doing? And you pay that little service fee in hopes of creating a more sustainable flight for yourself. So it's still lacking a little bit in the documentation and the proof, but certainly are an extraordinary um, storage vehicle for carbon and there should be a way that we can implement that a lot better. Certain countries have done it well. Scandinavian countries pay millions of dollars to help save forests in the Amazon, for example, through the carbon credit routine. And I, I just don't know why in America we've been so absolutely backwards, I think, in our thinking about that mechanism. We need to combine economists and sustainability scientists and foresters. We need to all work together and get that to happen a little more seamlessly. Well, with our new sustainability minor, we might be able to do that. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so any more questions? Love it. Thank you, Meg. A lot of comments still coming in. Um, just want to make sure there's, give everybody a, one last chance to, Ask Meg. All right, and see, we'll Maybe. finish by our time of eight o'clock. <laughs> yeah, even though we were running a little late, we're, 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 we're on time now. <laughs> Any more questions? Okay. Well, thank you, Meg, so much. Well, thanks, and happy holidays, everyone. I hope you have a very oh. green Christmas or we, New we Year's. One more, one more last minute question. Okay. I'm curious if there are any connections out there on the West Coast that may need a volunteer recreational research tree climber with experience in giant sequoias, hemlocks, and a litany of other research projects involving tree climbing. I miss oh my gosh. <laughs> totally. Go to Berkeley and talk to the botany department or the biology department. They have fabulous research on redwoods and that's where my students, Anthony and Wendy, that I pictured uh, came from and still are associated with. So there's a lot of fantastic things going on in uh, California. I'd be happy to point you in that direction. Okay. And again, more, more thank yous, more thank yous. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, thanks, everyone. Thanks to my friends in Elmira, Betsy and Beth and Mimi yeah, and everybody. Said thank you. Thanks to all the Elmira College folks for making this happen. <laughs> all right. Have a good night, everybody. Thanks, Meg. Bye.